is. And it's really difficult sometimes to explain what that is. Because I know his heart, and I can see it, but sometimes I don't have the words for it. And he's dismantling in me the old. Right? So I'm not a finished product. I'm under construction, deconstruction, the whole thing. But he's, he's dismantling, deconstruct, whatever you want to call it. So that, but all I want is the purity of what he has for us. Just the purity. Because if we've got the purity, we've got him. His heart, his presence, his holiness, his power. But it can't be contaminated by um, what I think, what we think, what I expect, what we expect. It's a total laying down. And you know, he says to me, you've not been this way before. And I know it. And so that's difficult because if I've not been that way before, I'm not quite sure what to look out for. <laughs> Oh, or what to expect, but he's so gracious and faithful. But the thing that scares me more than anything else, and I shared this with Cambry earlier this week, the thing that terrifies me, not in a bad way, but kind of bad way, good way, <laughs> is that I have to give an account for the state of every soul in open heaven. I have to stand before God and give an account for your spiritual health. And that's rather scary. So for the areas where I fail you, I ask your forgiveness. For the areas where I'm not what you need me to be, I ask your forgiveness. Talk to me. Say, I need this from you or I need that. Talk to me. We can talk things through, but if there's no dialogue and there's no communication, it's really difficult. But I just want to present you mature before Christ. When he put me into ministry, he gave me one uh, Colossians 127, that I would preach Christ and present people mature before him. So that's a pretty broad job description. But my heart for all of you is that you fulfill your destiny and that you achieve everything the Father's written for you to do. And so whatever it is that you require, I'm here to help you get it. But you need to talk to me. And, and let's have dialogue. So um, it's a new thing. And this new wine, this new, new wine requires a different relationship with the Holy Spirit than what we are aware of. So John chapter 16, verse 7. So Father God, I come before you today and I just, I just ask that what you want spoken would be what's spoken, that every word, every noise, every gesture, every intonation, everything would come under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that what is spoken here today would carry weight in the kingdom of God, not because of me, but because it's your heart, your will, your plan, your purpose, and your power. That, Father God, you would move as you desire to move, that you would do what you desire to do, that it would not be what we expect and not even what we want, but it's exactly what you will for us right now. And we take hold of the mantle that you placed upon this house, and we know that we are called and we have a great call. We know that you've called us to the nations. We know that you have called us to do things for you. We know that you've called us strategically and implicitly for such a time as this. And so we surrender to you. We lay down whatever it is that we think we are called to do and we lay it down and we say, you do with us what you want because we're here only to serve you, to serve no one else but to serve you. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. So I'm here to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because if we're going to be a new wineskin, you need to understand what the new wine is about. And I, I'm just love the Holy Spirit. Man, I love the Holy Spirit. And he is not the third person of the Godhead. He is God. 
We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is God. We tend to relegate him to the third person. We tend to relegate him to, oh, well, you know, there's the Father and there's Jesus oh, oh, and the Holy Spirit. But he is God the Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And he deserves as much honour and attention as we would give to the Father and to the Son, particularly as he is in charge of God's kingdom on earth. He is the government of God upon the earth. He is the presence of God upon the earth. He is the power of God upon the earth. He is the one who convicts the world of sin and he's the one who corrects believers. We don't get convicted. The world gets convicted. Believers get corrected. And so we have this amazing Holy Spirit, but I'm telling you something right now, we don't really know him. In fact, the early church, I'm not sure if this should go out on video, but the early church called him she. They believe the Holy Spirit was feminine. But that's the early church. I have no idea. Like, I don't know. All I know is I love the Holy Spirit. And he is amazing. But we tend to think of him as a dove. Gentle Holy Spirit, easily grieved, quenched. You know, we can grieve him, we can quench him. Oh my gosh, the only sin we can commit against that can't be forgiven is the sin against the Holy Spirit. But we don't really know him. We know that he's got gifts and we know that he's got fruit. But you don't really know him. You don't understand the moods of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a corporate lineup for people for healing. So the corporate anointing might be for healing. So that's the corporate one. But as, as people are ministered to, there is an individual anointing in within the corporate one. So one person might be delivered. One person might get anointed with oil. One person might get a word. One person might get a touch. It's all healing. But the corporate one is healing, but the individual things within that corporate one is all intimate and it's all, all tailored one-on-one -on -one because the Holy Spirit knows what we need. But we, we're sometimes even ignorant of the corporate anointing and what falls. The spirit of holiness was here before. The spirit of holiness was here. And we were having an invitation to linger longer in the spirit of holiness, but we didn't. So we need to understand what, what is being released. And this is a learning process. We don't have to get it right all the time. Understand that it is something we grow into. And I just take so much joy when I look at um, my grandchildren or little Roman or whoever and they start to learn to walk, you know. And they take one or two steps and they fall on their bums, bottoms, or their head, whatever, but they fall. And then they get up and they give it a go again and they fall. Or they try to run and they fall. But the parents don't stand there and say, oh, you stupid child, why can't you get your act together? You're supposed to be walking by now. What is oh, that's a wonderful, come on, sweetie, come on, sweetie. And that's what the father's like. He's wanting us just to get up and give it a go. He's not expecting perfection because that's religion. He's expecting a heart of love to respond to him. But we don't know the Holy Spirit, so how can you be a new wineskin and hold the new wine if you don't understand how the Holy Spirit works? So in John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said, it is better for you. It's more expedient for you. It's, it's um, the Amplified says, however, I'm telling you nothing but the truth. This is Jesus. When I say it is profitable, good, expedient and advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter, the counsellor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you. He will not come into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, Jesus said, I can send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. So it's better for us that Jesus went back to the Father so that we can have the Holy Spirit. You know, he is a glorious intruder. He is full of glory and he loves to intrude. He loves interventions. He loves interruptions. He loves to inconvenience us. He's just, he has a lot of fun at our expense. And you need to understand him, you know. We need to, like, really know how wonderful he is. The thing is, God has called us with certain of our, our assignments. We need to be able to ascend and we need to, enabled, oh, we need to be able to carry out those assignments in that realm of ascension. But it's really hard to do that if we do not understand the Holy Spirit. We can understand that we're positioned, we're ascended, 
But when we're given instructions about moving in the spirit realm and I want you to do this or take down that principality or whatever it might be, if you do not understand the moving of the Holy Spirit, it is really hard to flow with God and to get the results that God wants us to get. Now, sometimes I get Suzette results, which is nothing to write home about. But the God results... Like, wow, only God could do this. They're the ones that I want. They're the ones that we look for. They're the ones that we're hungry about. And so in order to do that, the old wineskin's got to be completely dismantled and the new wineskin's got to be allowed to be reworked, rewrought by the Holy Spirit, by God himself, by the power of the living word of God and filled with that new wine. But in order to do that, you need to know how he works for you. He works with you. He is amazing on your behalf. And so we're going to have a look at some of the Greek words just to pull out how amazing he is. Oh, I love the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says that he will come upon us. We will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the, of the earth. Well, when the Holy Spirit has come, has come upon me and I'm a witness for Jesus everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, I'm a witness for Jesus. And in John chapter 15, verse 26, again, it talks about us being a witness. It says, when the comforter, the counsellor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener and the standby comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he himself will testify regarding me, said Jesus, but you also will testify and be my witnesses because you've been with me from the beginning. And so we're going to be witnesses, but you need to understand the Holy Spirit. Like I said, we can quench him. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 says, quench not the Spirit of God, quench not the Holy Spirit. We can quench something by snuffing it out. You know when you've got a candle burning and you lick your fingers and you can just snuff it out. We can quench it, smother it, suppress it, douse it, put it out, snuff it out, extinguish it. I can do that to the Holy Spirit. That was a command to us. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about anything else but me. We have the ability to completely quench the Holy Spirit if we want to. Because he's a gentleman. Because in one way. Let me just, I'll explain that further as we go along. But he will not... You've got free will. He will not take that over. Now, I've given him permission to do whatever it takes to get me in whatever position he wants me to be in. So sometimes I find him rather ruthless. <laughs> but I gave him permission. But what, what happens is we're the ones that can quench the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that created everything at the Word of God. How amazing is that? We can quench him just by being in a bad mood. I can ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit and he'll just back off. We've got to seriously understand. Don't be distracted. Ephesians 4.30 said we can grieve the Holy Spirit. That means I can offend him. I can vex him. I can sadden him. I can make him uneasy. I can even make him sorry. And this is don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to explain how we grieve him with our emotions and things like that. But I want you to turn to Romans 8, 26. Now this is the Amplified. It says, so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid or helps us, bears us up in our weakness, our infirmities, for we don't know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings that are too deep for utterance. Like, I mean, I find that amazing that he will actually... Go and plead on my behalf before the Father. Like I don't even ask him to. He just goes and does it. He just goes and does it. So 
In eight, Romans 8.26, we see that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us on earth. Romans 8.34 says that Jesus intercedes for us in heaven. Hebrews 7.25 says Jesus ever lives to intercede for us. So right now, as we are sitting here, right now, as we are sitting in this room, you have the Holy Spirit interceding for you on earth. And you've got Jesus interceding for you in heaven. So for those times you feel backed into a corner, those times when you feel your prayers aren't going higher than the ceiling, those times when you think God's not anywhere, God, nothing's happening, God's not hearing, no one's praying for you, you have the Holy Spirit and Jesus in agreement praying over your life. How dare we complain? That no one's praying for us, no one's standing with me, no one's agreeing with me, that I'm all by myself. You are never by yourself. He is omnipresent. He is always with you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You carry him everywhere you go. But to think that every minute of my life, 24-7, I have the Holy Spirit praying on earth and Jesus praying in heaven. So if I want to really know how to learn to pray, I've got to slip into that slipstream between the two. And join up with the Holy Spirit and join up with Jesus and pray in accordance with the prayers that are coming from the throne room. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yes. Have we ever stopped to say, Holy Spirit, thank you for interceding for me. Jesus, thank you that you ever live to intercede for me, that as the high priest, you are continually bearing our names before the Father. And so they intercede. We can lie to the Holy Spirit like they did in Acts chapter 8. They lied to the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 5. They lied to the Holy Spirit. We can reject him. We can be stiff-necked. We can be stubborn. And in all of that, he still prays. He still intercedes. But he won't override our free will. But in Romans 8, 26, it says, you help me in my infirmities. When I don't know what to pray, Holy Spirit, you do. You. How many times have we thought, I don't know how to pray about this? Thank God for a heavenly language. Thank God for heavens, for tongues, right? But he helps us. He comes to our aid. And that word helps is an enormously long Greek word. It is Strong's G4878, for those of you who are interested, it's Strong's G4878. And it is, translation is probably wrong, but it is Sun Antilambanum Ahi, like it's long. He helps us. He Sun an, Sun Antilambanum Ahi helps us. Like it's this enormous Greek word for the word helps. But that means he takes up your cause. He champions you. Then he comes to help you. He actually champions what you're going through. He champions you. He takes up your cause. He carries it for you. He comes alongside of you and he says, you know what? I, it's like a tug of war and you're tugging on something. You want to manifest something from heaven and you've got this tug of war going on because maybe the flesh doesn't want it to manifest. Maybe the demonic doesn't want it to manifest. Manifest, but you're tugging because, man, I know this is the will of God and I'm going to manifest this on earth. And he comes and he joins your end of the tug of war and he heaves on it with you. Oh, my gosh, you don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. He tugs on that for you. How dare you think you can ever lose? How dare you think you can ever be victimised? He tugs on that with you. He carries it for you. He champions you. He stands before the Father. He prays for you. He intercedes for you. He carries it for you. He's your strength. He's your glory. He's the one who does it all. He is the one that brings God assistance to you. He is amazing in everything he says he makes intercession not only does he help us and champion you and carry your cause for you not only does he do all of that and heave on things with you like in a tug of war but he makes intercession and that intercession is g5241 and i had to write it out with all these initials and things between it it's hooper en tung kano hooper en tung kano Say it real quick, nobody would ever know. I don't know what I'm saying. But the hooper is hyper, over and above. It means exceedingly. And then the tunkano means aggressive action. 
let's get rid of the dove thing, right? Because the dove thing is gentle, meek, mild, easily disturbed, doesn't always rest. Let's understand the Holy Spirit for who he truly is. He came like a dove, doesn't mean he is one, right? The dove's a purity. But what it is, is this Tung Kano is an aggressive action. He throws himself into the midst of what's going on in your life and gets an, in, involved in it with you. Talk about that violent involvement. Yeah. Aggressive. Aggressive. We don't even understand what that means. If you think about something you've gone through, can you think about the power of the Holy Spirit coming in and just, I'm going to get in alongside of this with you and I'm going to heave on this. I'm going to champion your cause. I'm going to carry it for you. I am going to get aggressively involved in this until this turns out right. Yes, come on. How awesome is the Holy Spirit? Come on. God, the Spirit. He gets this righteous anger. This righteous indignation at what the children of God or what people, oppressed people are going through. And he wants to release you. He wants to set it right. That's what he's here for. But we don't give him a chance because we don't give him a split second of our time. And if we do give him a split second, it is so orchestrated by us. We move in the gifts we're comfortable to move in. Only if we think... Or no, it's him. What about moving in the gifts you're not comfortable in? What about allowing him to enlarge you, to stretch you, to, uh, to enlarge your capabilities and your capacities so that you truly get to know who he is and how he works? I love the fact that he gets aggressively involved in what's going on in my life. He makes a case for me. In John chapter 16, where it calls him the comforter. Now, the number of times I, I ask the Holy Spirit, comfort me. Oh, Holy Spirit, comfort me. I need some comfort. I sort of wrap myself in his presence, I thought, like a doona. Probably not a bad prayer, but it has nothing to do with comfort. It actually means in the Greek, he is your defense attorney. He's making a case for you. He's going into the courts of heaven and he's pleading your case and your cause before the judge. He's the counsel for your defence. He's your advocate. He's your defence counsel. He's the lawyer who defends you and represents you in the courts of heaven. How amazing is our Holy Spirit? So when he is our parakletos, don't just think of helper, legal advocate, powerhouse, a glorious intruder. He over and above strikes out against all of our infirmities in an aggressive way. And we're going to talk about those infirmities because he rises up with a righteous indignation. And we don't, we don't understand. And we don't lean on it. Don't lean on it. <laughs> Apart from the fact that it's broken, the Lord told me not to lean on the pulpit. We don't understand. I'm learning, Lord. We don't understand how upset the Holy Spirit gets. With sin, unrighteousness, oppression, violence. He gets upset that infirmities plague the body of Christ. He gets upset that there are demonic attacks that seem to be winning in the body of Christ. And he wants to help you now. But half the time we don't think about the Holy Spirit helping us in an aggressive way. Championing our cause. Rising up before the judge speaking on our behalf. He rips the, the weakness of the flesh or the, wanting to rip the weakness of the, of the infirmity, the weakness of the flesh, the demonic attack away from our lives, wanting to separate us from it. Understand, like, you know, talk about Rambo on steroids. <sighs> Not really the Holy Spirit, but understand what I'm saying. He has this, this passion in him to separate you from stuff that is destroying you, like the 50 fruits of pride. 
50 fruits of pride. He wants to rip that out of our lives so that Christ is fully conformed in us, so that that we mature in the things of God, so that we become everything Christ is and and release or represent Christ well on the earth. But he's got such a little, not little, but a still small voice. And he waits for us to pay attention. He waits for us to pay attention. He is jealous over you. Anything that disrupts your your relationship with the Father or the Son, he is jealous about that. When the kids were really, really little, just after the divorce, and the kids were little, they'd go to bed at night. Well, I'd put them to bed because they were too young to put themselves up. They'd go to bed. And I would put the TV on just for noise, just for the comfort to have adult voices in the house because it was so freaky quiet when my husband had left and the the divorce is through and the children are all in bed and everything's quiet. And so I'd have the TV on just playing in the background while I sewed or did whatever. And the Holy Spirit said to me one day, turn off the TV. And I thought, but then I'll hear noises. (laughs) You know, like, I really like the TV on at night. I like that. And I turn off the TV. And I said, Lord, Super Spiro, if that's really you, give me a scripture. (laughs) Psalm 101 verse 3, set no wicked thing before your eyes. There we go. TV's off. But a little bit later, it crept back in. And, you know, the same thing. He's jealous over our relationship with the Lord. But there were certain shows I wanted to watch. So I'd sit up to watch them. And as soon as it came on, I would see the opening minute and a half, I'd fall sound asleep. (laughs) And I would wake up as the credits roll at the end. (laughs) It was all the time. Like it was just like clockwork. So, okay, okay. But you know, and he's jealous over you, over anything that steals your relationship away from the Father, over anything that would dilute our devotion. He's yeah. jealous over that. He wants to get involved. He wants to change things. He wants to give you God's highest and God's best. And he gets enraged at circumstances that prohibit you from fulfilling your destiny. Mm-hmm. Understand that. Let me repeat that. He gets enraged at circumstances that actually stop you from getting into your destiny. He is not a dove. He is like a dove, but he is not a dove. He lashes out against infirmities and weaknesses and demonic attacks. He wants to strike it over and over and bring it to nothing. He wants to make intercession for us. The thing is, we don't always cooperate because we don't understand what he's like. We think about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? And the Holy Spirit just leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Like, come for a stroll, Jesus. <laughs> We're just going to go into the wilderness. You'll be fasting for 40 days. There'll be a few tempt, but it'll be fine. He's not like that. Have a look in Mark chapter 1, verse 12. In Mark 1, 12. It says, immediately the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. Like, that's aggressive. Mm -hmm. That's aggressive. And we don't put aggressive with the Holy Spirit anywhere. And because we don't necessarily associate passion with him or aggressive action with him or a violent involvement with him, we're missing out on so much of what he wants to do in our lives. And that word that, you know, he... Um, was in Mark 1.12, he drove him out. That's the word ekbalo, which we saw in Matthew chapter 10. It's used when they cast out demons 
and it was used when Jesus prayed and said, Lord, would you cast out um, harvesters into the harvest field? It's the same word, cast out, throw out, like kick them out, get them to do something. So the Holy Spirit ekballowed Jesus, cast him out, um, drove him out, sent him out with a violence to face the enemy. You understand that sometimes when you are facing the enemy, it is because the Holy Spirit has ekballowed you out there. Because he is wanting you to take the enemy on so that you can get a victory and you can clear the way for other people. You don't understand the attacks that come against you. One can be because of our own stupidity, our iniquities, or it can be that God is wanting you to face something, to bring it down to destroy it, to open the path up for others. Allow the Holy Spirit to ekbalo you, to drive you out, to cast you out, to send you where you need to be. We've got to know both sides of the Holy Spirit, not just the general one. He wants to come alongside of you and champion your cause. He wants to do everything for you so it comes in with aggressive action over and above anything that you would ever believe so that he can help you with your infirmities, your weaknesses, the demonic attacks that come against us. Have a look in John 14, 16. John 14, 16. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he'll give you another comforter, counsellor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby, that he may remain with you forever. The Holy Spirit's assignment is you. You are his assignment. He is called alongside of you forever. He, you are his assignment. How amazing is that? The Holy Spirit has been called alongside of you by the Father through Jesus Christ and you are his assignment. Down in verse 26. The comforter, the counsellor, the helper, the intercessor, the advocate, the strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit whom the Father sends in my name and in my place to represent me, to act on my behalf, he will teach you all things. Yeah. And he will cause you to recall everything I've told you. He'll bring everything back to your remembrance that Jesus told you. So he's going to show you things to come. He's going to bring things back to your remembrance that you need to remember at the right time and in the right way. And in John 15, 26, it says, When the Comforter comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify regarding Jesus. He is the spirit of truth. So if you are caught up in a lie anywhere, if there is a place in your life where there is no freedom, where you can't get free, you need the spirit of truth to come alongside and reveal the truth that you need to know so you can be free. He is so powerful. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away so you can have him. Because he's going to get aggressively involved in your life. He's going to change things. Thing is, salvation is available to everybody, right? That everybody in the whole wide world can have salvation. The only thing they have to do is receive it or say they want it. So we've got this amazing action of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. But if we are not aware of it, if we don't understand how he works, how can we even say, yeah, I want that? Or if I say, yeah, Holy Spirit, I want you to help me. That's like someone coming along and picking up a tea towel and helping me clean the dishes after dinner. Not that I'd do that, but you know what I mean? It's that kind of a help. We, we sort of minimalize what the Holy Spirit does instead of the fact that he gets aggressively involved in your life. So how much room do you make for the Holy Spirit? to become aggressively involved. And is some of the things that he's asked you to do, you haven't done because it seems too out there, but it's him. Because he is violently involved in your life because you are his assignment from God. 
we need to know the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so when it talks about infirmities, and you're going to have homework this weekend, or this week, He's called alongside of you to walk with you. The omnipresence, the power of God to encourage, to uplift, to mother you, to inspire you, to uh, enrich you, to improve you, to make you expert at what you do. But he is an enemy to some things. Now, we know he's an enemy to the kingdom of darkness. We know he's an enemy to um, flesh things. But he's an enemy to anything that would keep you average, a nominal Christian, mundane, mediocre, ordinary. He wars against religious spirits and the status quo. Oh, well, everybody does it, so, you know, I'll do the same thing as everybody. He hates that. He comes against numb acceptance. The place where we receive an Ishmael instead of the Isaac. The thing is, oh, well, it's almost like what I asked for, so I'll take that instead of realising you've been offered an Ishmael and you should have waited for your Isaac. He, he, he wars against numb acceptance yes. and almost their experiences. Almost. You know, you pray for something and it's so close you can almost touch it, almost manifest it, almost there. But it never quite, he wars against that because that's not the will of God for your life. The Holy Spirit is amazing. He loves you so deeply and so passionately. So down in um, Romans 8, 27, it says, He searches the hearts of men and knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God on behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. And in verse 26, you know, he makes intercession for us. He meets our, our supplication, pleads on our behalf. Well, that word um, intercession we'll look at, but he comes against the infirmities, our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. He bears us up in our weaknesses, in our infirmities. Infirmities is a weakness of the flesh. Infirmities can be where you get no result. Like I've just, you know, like no matter how hard I try, no matter what I do, I just can't seem to get the breakthrough. That is an infirmity. An infirmity will keep you placated, pacified and docile. It will tame you. Then the literal meaning of that word infirmities, it actually talks about the demonic spitting on you and demonic whipping. That is the literal translation if you take it back to the original Greek, to the Hebrew, to the Aramaic, to the... It actually talks about that infirmity. It is a demonic spitting, a demonic repeated whipping, or a demonic constraint that keeps you forever bowed down. Has anyone ever felt like that? Yep. That sometimes, no matter what you do, there just seems to be this continual kind of like, I just keep getting whipped or keep getting beaten. Going round the cycle again, the infirmity. We tend to think it's just a sickness and it's just a disease and it's just a weakness. But if you take it back to the original language, it's so much more than that. The whipping talks about a familiarity, you know, like you're close enough to be whipped. You've got to be close to be whipped. So there is a familiarity there with the enemy. Physical whippings, like if, a, if you're getting a demonic whipping and your infirmity is a demonic whipping, it can take the case of a generational disease that just keeps getting repeated in the family, one whipping after another, whether it's whatever it might be, cancer. I'm trying to think of, and my mind's gone completely blank, but you know what I mean? It's that demonic whipping of disease that just continued to go down. In my, fam in my mother's side, uh, the women can be subject to a disease that they go blind. Um, Praise God, not, not in my family, but my mum, my grandma was blind. My mum had the same thing. Her sisters, I've got nieces with it. It's just only the women, um, but they go blind. So this is a, a whipping of the enemy, right? There's no let up. It's a continual lashing. Come on, guys, you've got to start to wake up to what's going on in the spirit realm. 
so that you can understand how to walk through it in the natural. It can be generational. It can be things like alcoholism, any kind of addiction. It can be terminal illnesses. It can be anything where you're constantly plagued. And I heard somebody say yesterday, you know, when you're continually going around the mountain, cycle after cycle, and you just can't seem to get the breakthrough, don't use the word cycle. It's actually a chain. You're chained in the bondage and you can't get free. But this is what an infirmity is. It's not just a, a sickness or a disease. It's not just a weakness. If you take it back to the original meaning, you go back through the layers of language. This is actually what it talks about. And it talks about a demonic spitting. That actually means that there comes upon... Who's ever felt this? Because I've used to feel it quite often. It's almost like a cloak would come upon you where you think, what's the point of even trying? Nothing ever really changes. A cloak of hopelessness or inevitable, well, this is just the way my life is. It's, I'm really not going to get free of this. That actually is a demonic spitting. Things will never change. Well, you can't progress. You can't seem to overcome in this one region. It's a heavy weight. It's a yoke of burden that doesn't allow you to stand up to your full height. Who's ever felt burdens that you know there's more in you than what you're actually living. You know that there's more in you. You know that you're bigger than that. You know, but you just can't seem to reach your destiny. You just can't seem to stand up to your full height. Mm -hmm. It is a demonic infirmity that has been released upon us. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to be aggressive in his actions. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to be violently involved with who we are and what we do. We need that, not just what we think help is, but what it actually says it is in the original language. Mm -hmm. That enemy, that demonic spitting, saps our boldness. We stop being bold. We stop being courageous. We stop speaking out about Jesus or whatever it might be. We stop standing up for the truth. And the whole goal of this demonic whipping, demonic spitting is to bring us into agreement with the infirmity. If we are in agreement with the infirmity, guess what? There'll be no victory because we've come into agreement with the enemy. Because we've agreed that, you know what, for somebody else God might do it, but he's not going to really do it for me. And so we're stuck in this thing and nothing's ever going to set me free. And this is just the way life is and I can't see it ever changing. And I can't see financial increase coming or I can't see this, this sickness or disease leaving my body. We just lose all hope. We lose sight of what God has promised. And we've actually come into agreement with an infirmity that is demonically inspired. And the Holy Spirit has been brought alongside of you to actively get involved in your life, to present your case before God, to champion your cause, to heave on that thing with you, to set you free. Because the last thing that I want is to come into an agreement with an infirmity. But he is a glorious intruder. So looking at some of the things that he does as he helps, as he intercedes, he throws himself into my cause. He throws himself into it. Have you got a, you know, got a friend that will come along when you're going through something difficult, like... I don't know what it might be. I will use Danielle as an example because she's awesome for me. But sometimes, you know, when I'm struggling to get something done and she's just as tired as I am, she will throw herself into what I'm doing to free me up so I can get back to prayer. She's incredible. She throws herself into it even though she's as tired as I am, even though she's got a longer to-do list than I have. She will throw herself into it to, to help me. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He throws himself into your case, into your cause, so that he can get you set free. He will guide your prayers. Not only will he guide your prayers, but he's actually praying for you alongside of Jesus right now. He interferes in your life to bring about um, divine breakthrough. 
The Holy Spirit will interfere. He will bring into, into what they call them, interventions, spiritual interventions, so that you can be set right. He will shock us into an awareness of who we really are in Christ, shock us into our identity. He will shock us into our destiny, if that's what needs to be done. He will discomfort us if we are too comfortable where we are, if we are reclining in our infirmity thinking, oh, well, I'm just going to have to put up with this for the rest of my life. He will shock us into an awareness. He will discomfort us. He will push us out of the past, present scenarios that we have in our mind all the time. This is what, I, this is what I've come from. This is where I am. And he's going to push us into the present future. He changes our scenarios. He will change us if we allow him. He will rub me the wrong way to get me to go the right way. He will ruffle my feathers so I soar like an eagle instead of strut around like a turkey. Right, come on. Some of this uncomfortable stuff we go through, we think it's the enemy. Just stop and discern. Is this the Holy Spirit rubbing you the wrong way to get you to go the right way? Is he ruffling your feathers so that you start to soar like an eagle? Is he bellowing you? Is he pushing you out to face something so that you get the victory? The Holy Spirit is amazing and mighty and wonderful and glorious and powerful and passionate and and so in love with you, zealous over you, jealous for you. He just wants the best for you. But you know what? We relegated him to the third person of the Godhead instead of they're all God. We've relegated him and think of him as the dove. We've got to be careful around the Holy Spirit. Man, we can quench him. We can grieve him. Oh, my gosh, I can even be blaspheme him and I can never be forgiven. But we've never looked past that, really, to how amazing he is, that he really wants to champion your cause, that even right now, as he's interceding for you, he's before the judge of the courts of heaven and he's laying out your case along with the voice of the blood of Jesus Christ in agreement with the prayers of Jesus, praying for you, laying it out before you. We think it all relies upon us. It is all about how much we pray and what we do and how much we it's got nothing to do with that. That's the that's what does have, but it doesn't. The important thing is he's doing it. I rely upon his prayers, not mine. Father, if you're going to listen to any prayers about my life, listen to his. Right, listen to Jesus. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And if I happen to be in agreement with them, awesome. If not, they're the ones I want you to pray. Answer them, right? Answer those prayers. Answer them. Pull me into line with their prayers. You know, you've got to understand he's powerfully passionate about you. He's wanting to get the members of your family saved that aren't saved. He's wanting to pull in the prodigals. He's wanting to do all of these things. But we think of him and we've relegated him. We talk about a new wineskin. We talk about being filled with new wine. But in reality, we've relegated him. And I'm not talking about people here, but church in general. We've relegated him. to a peripheral. He's on the sidelines. Occasionally we might move in the gifts. Occasionally we might live in the fruit. But we've not really honoured the Holy Spirit because we haven't understood his job description. He is the governor of God upon the earth. He is God's governance upon the earth. The kingdom of God is not what we eat and drink, but it's righteousness, righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of truth, spirit of war, spirit of judgment, spirit of burning, spirit of love. So many different titles for the Holy Spirit. And he's wanting you to know him. He is inviting us on a journey of intimacy to get to know the Holy Spirit. To get to know him so that we can flow with him. So that we can truly ascend 
and be able to take that assignment from that ascension and bring it about in, in, in the right manifestation. A lot of times now we know that we're ascended, that we've come to Zion, we know that, and, and some of us are there constantly and others are still like trying to get there, trying to like practice, practice it for want of a better word. But there's an element of the Holy Spirit that takes you further and deeper and richer. And there's such a wholeness in him. And we've not allowed him to be him. We've not really opened up the space. Like if he wants to roar against the enemy, let him. If he wants to groan through you in your prayer time, let him. If he wants to tickle you with an angel feather so that you're rolling around on the floor laughing, you probably need the joy of the Lord in a big dose. Take it. We need the Holy Spirit. If he wants to worship through us. Yes. And he's the one who worships through us. Like there's no way I can worship in spirit and in truth. Like I'm still imperfect. I'm still a mix of new creation, unrenewed soul. So I can desire to worship in spirit and in truth. But I need the Holy Spirit who is the spirit and is truth in order to do it. He is the best. Absolutely the best. And he's inviting all of you into a richer, deeper relationship. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to speak knowing that the Holy Spirit himself has put the words in your mouth, that he's anointed those words, and that when they come out, they'll pierce the hearts of your listeners. Wouldn't it be amazing if you really heard the Holy Spirit and he'd say, just go and lay your hand on that person's shoulder as you walk past and you release a blessing or a healing. He's amazing. And he's the one who brings his super, God's super, into our natural. And we can't be a new wineskin filled with new wine unless we know him. And he's inviting us to know him more, deeper, richer. There's just no end to the Holy Spirit. He's like God, no beginning, no end, just is. Just is. And he loves you. And you are his assignment. He has been called alongside of you to bring you into your destiny, to cause you to be everything that God wants you to be, to set you free from infirmities, weaknesses, 